Dear Don, I received three more death row sentences by the jury in Marion. The judge will side with them. The world is very wrong, very ignorant, callous, stupid. I've seen enough stupidity to know and I want out. Did I look real skinny on TV? If not, I'm 128 pounds. TV does make you look a lot heavier than you are. That also was intentional by the males who took snaps of me. Pure hatred against me on their part because I hustled and am considered a whore. Which actually men are more of than any woman is. Number two, because I had enough balls to knock off some rapist through hooking as a labeled whore. And number three, because women aren't supposed to pose such power and authority over themselves against an assailant. We're supposed to be abused, used, raped, and beaten in the call the cops after. Actually, I should be given a medal for it. I help society and other girls from the scums. The men are simply jealous, plus fear other women will do the same justifiable thing. Do I hate men? Not really. Just ones that think like this because their brains are in their ass and penis only. I pray everything's going fine for you. Tell Davy I said hi and uh, y'all take care. For now, zip. Love, Lee. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we dive into the case you all had a voice in selecting last season over on Facebook and Instagram, Miss Aileen Carol Warnos, one of America's most notorious female killers to date. Her body count didn't compare to that of Green River Killer or Bundy, but her mental state and the words she spewed is what made her famous. Aileen, or Lee, as she was known to those who knew her as a sex worker from Michigan, she was abandoned by her mother at the age of four and was turning tricks for money, cigarettes, and whatever else she desired by the time she was 11. She learned at too young of an age that sex equaled money. But what developed underneath during that time was pure hatred for men willing to pay money for sex. And it's a seed that would flourish in her well into becoming an adult and drove her to murder seven men who she claimed was only wanting to do her harm. This is a wild case, and one leaving us in states of shock from the words she uses to describe each moment of her life. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of sexual abuse, adult language, criminal behavior, listeners' discretion is advised. If any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, my true crime nerds. I'm sorry about last week and the week prior because the week turned into a break. And instead of jumping right into the series, but the first week your girl needed a break. And last week, if technology could be against me, it was every step of the way. So I scrapped audio and started over. And here we are. I'm a mom on the run these days, and sometimes you have to just take a second and breathe, and then the universe has a way of stepping in. 
So we just have the usual to get to today. Patreon is up and running, you guys. And there are a couple bonus episodes that are over there and some behind the scene look into the show. Not to mention that episodes are completely 100% ad free. So if this is something that interests you, go over to Patreon and have a look around. Eric? You can still support the show by heading to the truecrimelibrarian.com and making that one time donation to support the show. If you'd like to do so without a penny leaving your pocket, then get on Facebook, get on Instagram, get on YouTube, and share, like, recommend, review the show, you guys. Tricking these algorithms is an art form that I have yet to master. And I'm not going to lie, I'm really bad about posting to social media. So this will help the show out in a long run. And it's one of the best ways you can do so. Enough of all of this. Let's get to what you all came here for. The true crime. All right. Let me introduce you to Miss Aileen Carol Pittman, who would later go by Warnos. She was born on February 29th, 1956, which makes her a very rare gem in this world of having a birthday to fall on the only day that occurs once every four years. This happens for about one in a 1,461 births, so many would say that that would make the baby lucky. But with Aileen, she had everything but luck. Lee was born to Diane and Leo Pittman. Diane and Leo married when Diane was just 14 and, at, and he was 17. And in their first year, the couple had welcomed their son, Keith Pittman, and this is Lee's older brother. By the time that Lee was born, her parents were going through a divorce. Diane was going to raise both of these kids on her own and nobody was going to stop her, except she didn't. When Keith was about five and Lee was about four, Diane dropped the two off at her parents, Laura, Lori, Lowry, and Britta Warnos, and she left, and they didn't see her again. Lee was named after her grandmother, whose given name is Eileen, but she went by the name Britta, and Aileen, she ended up shortening hers to Lee. Laurie and Britta weren't exactly the best option for the two kids. Both of them were verbally abusive. Both of them were alcoholics. Um, Lowry, I mean, I don't know. He, he, he also had a hard time keeping his hands to himself. But in their mind, they were going to do right by family and they were going to raise their family. On March 18th of 1960, Lori and Britta officially adopted Keith and Lee and gave them their last name of Warnos, which is why Aileen goes by Warnos and not Pittman. Both decided to wait to tell the children that they were adopted until they turned the age of 12. During this time, their father, Leo Pittman, he had been prisoned on the charge of raping a seven-year-old little girl. Once he was convicted of the crime, he was sent over to Leavenworth State Penitentiary, where he would later be diagnosed as schizophrenic. Having a parent with a mental disorder doubles the risk that the child will be diagnosed with a mental illness in their lifetime, which if you've ever seen Lee in any interview setting following her arrest and thought that she wasn't speaking in these coherent thoughts, you'd be right to say there was something wrong. But unlike her father, Lee tends to show more tendencies to BPD or borderline personality disorder. On January 30th of 1969, Leo was found hanging um, from some sheets in his cell. As her father was going through everything that he was going through, Lee was starting to go through things as well. She started messing around with her brother Keith pretty early on. Um, and when I say messing around, I mean sexually. The two were doing things that brothers and sisters shouldn't be doing. By the time she was 11 in 1967, she had already begun having sex and selling herself to supply the things she desired. Money, drugs, cigarettes. We can thank her father slash grandfather for this because this man couldn't keep his freaking hands to himself. 
In some of her letters to her childhood best friend from the book Dear Dawn, Lee talks about her having sex at a young age with who she thought was her father. And she was letting us know that Keith and her were doing things as well. For Lee, sex was just a means to an end that she wanted. It seems as though Lee was born into a family that physically and verbally told her how much they didn't want her. And that she was nothing more to them than a burden and the only thing that she could offer was sex. Well, Lee learned sex offered her the ability to escape it all. I mean, if she could have sex with somebody and they would give her money, then if she got enough money together, she wouldn't have to deal with her father, grandfather. She wouldn't have to deal with, you know, her verbally and physically abusive grandmother. And she could maybe find a place that would want her. Because I could not imagine putting the persona on a child that somebody doesn't want you, that you are nobody in this world. Nobody will ever love you. Nobody will ever want you. How do you do that? How does an adult actually do that to a child? You are setting them up for so many disabilities in the future. And I'm talking about emotional disabilities. We see sex as a way of expressing love to show the other how much they mean to us. And it's a form of really bonding with another person. And today we're a lot more, we see a lot more openness about sex and you know, what it means for everybody. Not everybody um, hangs around till they're married and only does it with one person in their life. Uh, it's a very socially acceptable thing to do today. So could you imagine losing whatever it is that drives you to have sex? Could you imagine losing that and sex just be another task you have to perform? That's what it was like for Lee because this was taken from her at the age of 11. Imagine not being able to form that bond with anyone in your life. How different would your life be if you lack that capacity to bond to your partner? That is what sexual abuse does to its victim. It takes from them the ability to love deeply and to commit to another person and to trust them because you really don't go around and just sleep with somebody you don't trust right this was life and this is what it was teaching lee at the age of 11. in 1970 she was 14 and she claims that her grandfather or her father and it actually started about when she was 13 began letting his buddies come over and do to lee what he did as well as whatever they wanted to. Well, guess what? She's 14, which means she is going through the cycle of life and she ends up pregnant with her son. And she is unable to say who the father was. Was it her grandfather slash father? Was it one of his friends? Was it one of the guys she had sold herself to for $5 or, you know, who who fathered her? I mean, she could not honestly answer because of the promiscuity and the abuse that was going on. And just to be clear, 14 is not old enough to be consenting to sex, just FYI. So even her saying, yes, I will sell myself to you for a pack of cigarettes, she's too young to be making that decision. What Laurie was doing by allowing his friends to cross that line with the girl, he was supposed to be her father. He was supposed to be her grandfather. He was supposed to protect her from people like him and his friends. It's rape no matter how you paint that picture. Even if she said yes, she is too young to say yes to that. Lee was sent to a home for unwed mothers when she became pregnant and her grandparents found out. While she was in the home on March 12th of 1971, her grandmother Britta passed away from liver failure associated with alcohol abuse. Lee wasn't truly close to either of her grandparents, but I can't imagine that 
her losing her grandmother as she's going through what she's going through didn't help going on didn't help what was going on inside of Lee's head. On March 23rd of 1971, Lee gave birth to her son and immediately she gave him up for adoption. Lee was nowhere close to being mature enough to be a mother and Lord knows there was lack of support at home to help her come home and, and form into a mother. So giving him, giving him up was the best decision she could have made. And in hindsight, it was one of her more mature decisions that she will make sometime in her life. Following the birth of his great grandson and the death of his wife, he gave up on Lee and Lori kicked her out of the house. Lee was left to sleep on the ground. She was left to sleep in abandoned cars and trees, wherever she could find a place. And if she needed money for food or whatever else, then she decided to prostitute. Aileen used what she was taught starting early, and this led to her violent outbursts. This led to her stealing because she could and because she needed it. It led to her being destructive. She set fire to a house, and she set fire in a girl's restroom. All of this became one of the best recipes for a serial killer. Aileen Warnos is one of America's most notorious serial killers, and some may be sitting here listening to me say these things and think I'm offering an excuse for what she did. Let me be very clear. I'm not, but when you hear of a background like this, you can't help but wonder what would have happened had Lori and Britta been better parents for her after being abandoned by her own mother. How much different could everyone's life had been had no grown man or child touched and desensitized her to sex, which later inhibited her from forming any kind of a bond. What would she have been like today had that not happened? You can't help but wonder. And it, like I said, it's not an excuse. It doesn't excuse what she did. She is a violent, murderous person. And if you would have let her out had she been handed life with the possibility of parole and she paroled out, there's no doubt in my mind that she would have killed again. We could not trust anybody. And after hearing what she went through as a child, you can understand why she lacked the ability to be a trusting person. You have to be very careful. Um, in the world of true crime, I've had a lot of people call me out and say that I sympathize too much with the perpetrator. They say I'm overly critical of my victims and I'm just all around just not grasping the concept of true crime, right? I don't think there's a concept that we must follow. I don't think there's this like rule that says I'm not allowed to care about a perpetrator. I don't want to see a history like this. I wouldn't want that for anyone. And I'm also not going to paint you a picture of a perfectly innocent, 100% without fault victim either. We are human. We make shitty mistakes. So no, I'm not giving Aileen some out for what she did. What she did was violent. What she did was she stole lives because she couldn't trust. That's what she did. But you can understand where it comes from. And that's not me siding or giving her excuses. That is just basic empathy in the world of that we live in. Okay? So... Don't misconstrue what the information I'm giving to you. I'm giving it all to you. Good, bad, ugly. I never, ever don't do that. I may not like that I'm fixing to tell you something horrible about the victim, but I'm going to tell you because you can relate. And the more you relate to, the, to that, the more the story becomes real, even though it is based on real events, but you see it as more of a real case. It could happen to any one of us. It simply, that's just how true crime works.
Okay, on May 27th of 1974, we see Aileen become an actual criminal for the first time, and she's just 18 years old when she's arrested in Colorado. Sex work allowedly means to travel, but once in Colorado, her fucking attitude is like what I like to call it. It leads to her very first big criminal charge. Some people start off with something minor, something, uh, you know, petty shoplifting. Um, Back when I was a kid, hot checks, something super minor ends you with your first criminal charge and it seems to snowball. But for Aileen, she's like, let's go, let's do this. So in Jefferson County, she was charged with a DUI. She was charged with firing a firearm from a moving vehicle and disorderly conduct. This is huge for her first crime. But as soon as Lee posted bail, she skipped town committing her second crime. So she just, you know, nobody else had to face responsibilities and consequences. Why should she? Lee worked as a sex worker following her Colorado arrest, and it managed to get her self-hitchhiked all the way to Florida, the state that would plunge chemicals into her arm because of the crimes she commits. On May 12th of 1976, Lori Warnos walked into his garage, started his vehicle, and ran it until his life ended because he had ingested more carbon monoxide than oxygen. His youngest son is his actual son and not an adopted grandchild, walked into the home and found his father gone. Popular right now on Netflix is American Boogie Woman, and it is loosely based off the next point in Lee's life. Once in Florida, Lee meets Louis Gratz Bell, Commodore of the local yacht club, also known as president of the club. Louis made his money on the notion of big risk yield big rewards. He invested his money. He was he also would give tours of the local scenery to those high in society and in celebrity. He was good at whatever he put his mind to. When Lee walked into Lewis's life, he had picked her up on the interstate, and he was already a two-time divorcee, and from the moment that he picked her up, he was smitten with her loud mouth and eccentric personality. For Aileen, this was something stable, and it didn't require her to sell herself to make ends meet. On May 4th of 1976, two months following the death of her grandfather, Aileen, Mary Lewis in Kingsley, Georgia. Lee then clipped out the newspaper write-up about their nuptials and sent it back home to Miss Michigan. Lee had found her meal ticket and she had enough that she would never have to worry about anything in her life again. Lewis was ready and willing to give her everything that she wanted. But Lewis was in his late 60s when they married, so his idea of a married life was staying home and staying in and enjoying time being spent together. But Lee was this wild child. She had been on her own since she was 14. She had basically done whatever she wanted since she was 11. This had been her whole life. So she wanted to do what most 20-year-old people want to do. She wanted to go to bars. She wanted to have a good time. In early of July 1976, Lee took Lewis back to her hometown in Michigan in their brand new Cadillac. For Lee, being able to show that kind of status was a thrill for her. But on July 13, 1976, a decision would start to spiral her down and she would lose Lewis. Lewis wanted to stay in, but Lee wanted to catch up with some of her old and new friends down at this place called Bernie's Club in Mancelona, Michigan. Words ended up being exchanged following Lee trying to hustle over at the pool tables. And in a fit of rage, Lee was slowly starting to become the person she is known for and she hauls off and throws the cue ball at the bartender's head. Well, Lee was arrested and charged with assault and battery and to add to it all, she had a couple fugitive warrants from Troy Police Department that stemmed from a DUI and unlawful use of a driver's license 
and not being in possession of a Michigan's driver's license. This was Lewis's wake up call. Her anger was starting to get out of control and she was having a harder and harder time reining that in. And he soon has a very hard lesson to learn. Lewis decided that Lee had already cost him enough money. She was blowing through his money and he had earned that, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. And he wasn't just going to let her blow it every time she needed bell money or going out and buying the entire bar a round of beer followed by 16 rounds of shots. He had, he was done. So he decided that he was going to do what he had done with the first two wives. And he was going to cut off Lee's allowance if she was not going to curb her spending and get caught up, quit getting caught up with the law. So he comes down the next morning and he's going to tell her, my decision is this. And he gets out just, he was going to stop her. And then next thing he knows, Lee has grabbed his walking cane and she is beating him with it. And that's not funny. That's awful. But in my head right now, I can see this incident occurring. She then takes a meat skewer and sticks it too close for comfort to his neck and that was it for him like any sane person he immediately went down he got a restraining order against his wife he may have missed those early red flags that should have sent him running for the hills but he wasn't going to be need to be told twice and on July 17th of 1976, Aileen left because her brother, Keith Warnos, succumbed to throat cancer. It had just completely ridd riddled his body by the time he had went and seen anybody for care. He did tell Aileen in their last visit while he was in the hospital that she was going to be the beneficiary of his $10,000 life insurance policy. And, you know... She, she was going to come in 10 grand. She was married to a man with a lot of money. Life could have been easy for Lee had she been able to rein in that anger. And she couldn't. On July 19th, 1976, just two days following her brother's death, Lewis has the marriage to Lee annulled. And some report that the two actually divorced. But clarity of whether it was a divorce or annulment isn't something that is being harped too heavily on. What you need to know is he got Lee out of his life quick, fast, and in a hurry, which saved him in the long run. There is some misconception going on, especially because of the movie that Lewis has passed away or that Aileen killed him. He, he has passed away. He passed away around the age of 92, very comfortably in his own home. Lee did that. She didn't have anything to do with his death. As a matter of fact, I want to say he didn't die until after Lee was um, executed. So he got to see her life end before his. On August 4th of 1976, Aileen pleads guilty to the assault and battery charge back from home. Following this plea is when she actually gets the check from Keith's life insurance, which she uses to pay those fines. She uses it to put some money down on a brand new black Pontiac and a slew of other shit that she didn't need, but she wanted. She was completely 100% irresponsible with this money and she blows through it in three months. That block, that black Pontiac, there's rumor that it was wrecked and then there's rumor that it was repossessed. In the end, she didn't have it very long. Um, so she was back to square one with having nothing and having nowhere to go. Come 1981, Lee is living with a retired businessman who was currently separated from his wife, and the two were staying in a trailer park. And even though the man knew that Lee was loudmouth and short tempered, he said she could be very warm, loving, and resourceful. Was she in love with this guy? We'll never know. We weren't even sure if she could have fallen in love with Lewis. It seemed that Lee stayed with those who proved that could be a means to an end. If she was in love with either man, we'll never know because the men she had been with before or the interaction with them 
clouded any chance that she had to be able to feel and recognize genuine love. On May 20th of 1981, Lee purchased a gun and some bullets from a local pawn shop. She took that and a six-pack of beer and drives down the road. She contemplates suicide, but instead she stops at this market in Edgewater. She walks into the local store with $118 in her purse. She has been drinking heavily, and she is there to buy another six-pack of beer and a couple Slim Jims. She puts her items up on the counter, and when she slings her purse up there with the gun and the bullets, the butt of the gun is very visible to the attendant, and she starts to scream, thinking that Lee is there to rob her. Lee had money in her wallet, and up until that point, she never considered actually robbing the place, but when you have this screaming clerk and a person who makes irrational decisions, you're left with what the hell? Let's do this. So Lee pulls the gun out and she robs the store. She walks away with her six pack Slim Jim's $33 and a pack of cigarettes. She leaves and she takes off down the highway. She ends up blowing like her radiator or something and a couple of teenagers, they help push her car to the next gas station. And now she realizes she's robbed a convenience store and she's a criminal on the run and she needs to get the fuck out of Dodge. Basically, she would later add in life that she decided to knock the store over to see if the guy that she was living with, the business guy, truly loved her. And if he was truly in love with Aileen, then he should have been able to get her out of the trouble that would stem from knocking over the convenience store. But you and I both know that love doesn't trump the justice system. She committed armed robbery. I don't care how much clout said boyfriend, girlfriend had, getting her out of something of this magnitude was impossible. You really almost needed to be the ruler of the entire world to make that disappear. Well, on Thursday, May 4th, 1982, Aileen Warnos is sent over to Florida Correctional Center and wow, he didn't love her enough. <laughs> She would spend over a year inside the Florida Correctional Center where she was disciplined six times for fighting and disobeying orders from the correctional staff. She was released from prison on June 30th of 1983. Prior to her trial convicting her of armed robbery, she... Her state appointed attorney asked that she be evaluated by psychiatric professionals due to her suicidal tendencies. And these were the findings from that evaluation. The prisoner is a 25 year old white divorced female who has an appreciation of the charges against her. And she says she does not know the range and nature of the possible penalties. She understands the adversary nature of the legal process and has a capacity to disclose to attorney pertinent facts surrounding the alleged offense, to relate to attorney, to assist attorney, prosecution, witness, to manifest appropriate courtroom behavior, to testify relevantly, to cope with the stress of incarceration prior to trial and is motivated to help herself in the legal process. It is my medical opinion that the defendant is competent to stand trial, was legally sane at the time of the alleged crime, and does not meet the criteria for involuntary hospitalization. Now, Upon Lee's release, she moves to live in with one of her pen pals from the program within the Florida prison system. You know what? Let me go back. I had talked earlier, part one of this, about um, Lee's father. And he had the mental disorder of schizophrenia. And some would say Aileen kind of fits that um definition but really what she really does have a definition is borderline personality disorder when you're going back over this evaluation from the psychiatrist and you're seeing this and you're seeing that she's capable of of helping out with her case she's capable of giving them accurate information 
she she may not understand the full magnitude of what's coming her way but she does understand that what she did was wrong and it had consequences to go with it that's not a person who would fit the schizophrenia profile because they would be very just delusional um about the right and wrong of the crime they would not be willing to help out their attorney in any way for fear of them being out to get them to um you have all of this coming up from a person who is schizophrenic and Aileen wasn't that way she knew that her court appointed attorney was somebody there to help her whether she actually ever trusted this individual is it's not the same she still gave the information over that she could she still was willing to appreciate the consequences came with the charge and she didn't really i mean she's often mentioned ending her own life but i think if push comes to shove she wouldn't have done it i think it's more of an attention grabber because as much as aileen is on her own she thrives for attention because that's not something she got as a kid all the attention she did get was negative and so she just assumes all attention is negative and if i do something stupid well then you have to pay attention to me that is the scope of aileen and her thinking which fits really well with borderline personality disorder and i'm going to get more into that once we get into the trial following the murders but I wanted to stop and, and circle back over here because it's very important. Although Aileen does have a profile of a mental disorder, it did not keep her from accurately supplying information and it did not keep her from understanding the magnitude of her crime has a consequence and she was able to help her attorney build her defense. All of that says she's competent to stand trial that does not mean that she doesn't have a mental deficit which she did with bpd so i wanted to circle back and clear that up she does have mental problems mental health issues but they did not she knew what she was doing she knows right from wrong and she knows that it had consequences which landed her in prison now, upon her release, she moved to live in with one of the pen pals from the pen pal program within the Florida prison system. His name is Thomas Sheldon. And while she was living with this new man, her problems seemed to just follow her. He tried to get her some psychiatric help, but the clinic that he wanted to take her to and the one that he had contacted denied taking her when she told them that she didn't have anything wrong with her that all of the things that are wrong with me are because thomas didn't do this or thomas did this it's all his fault she's completely innocent of all and they decided mm, you don't fit that criteria for us so he decided she was more than he was willing to take on and he sent her back to florida the man from the trailer park wasn't taking her back. The pen pal didn't want her. Lee was once again without anyone. No one wanted her. And as far as she was concerned, it was all of their faults. Nothing that she did caused that. In January of 1984, Lee was dropped off by two men um, near New Smyrna, beach with a truck driver and this truck driver he really did like lee he knew that she needed a place to stay and as long as you know she helped out and paid rent she was good so lee she cooked she cleaned and she kept herself pretty put together with this one he was living in a very quiet neighborhood and he really wanted someone quiet however lee was not that girl she was bitter she blamed everyone but herself for her troubles that seemed to follow her no matter where she went. On May 1st, 1984, Lee had another run-in with the law. She was a caught attempting to pass forged checks in Key West at Barnett Bank. 
she decided it was a great idea to forge her employer's signature for two checks. And I'm not even, this hurts my head. So one was for five grand and one was for $595. Okay. Back at that time, 1984, five grand's a hell of a lot more money. It's probably equivalent to about 15 grand today. How, why would you write a check? <laughs> why would you write one check for five grand and the only one for $595? I don't know if there was like something specific that she wanted or that she knew she needed to do with the money and $5,595 was going to cover the cost of whatever that was. I don't know if that's what it was. I don't know. It just, when I read the difference in the prices, it really just, I was like, what? What? Why? It's not making sense. <laughs> Anyways, in the end, we ends up belling out of gel and poof, she's gone again. <laughs> On November 30th of 1985, Lee was named a suspect in the theft of a pistol and ammunition in Pasco County. The victim was a man who had taken her in and boarded her when she needed a place to stay for a couple of nights. She was paying him in sex, something that she knew was worth more than money. If it wasn't worth more, it was worth as, you know, equal amounts, like, I can give you $600 or I can sleep with you X, Y, Z amount of time. You know what I'm saying? It's also during this time that Lee has her very first recorded same-sex relationship with a woman named Tony who lived in Key West. Lee is, the, the thing about Lee's case is we know that she was a sex worker and that she had been killing her Johns, which it's, a little ironic that last season at the end we covered Green River Killer who killed sex workers and this time I'm telling you about a story of a sex worker killing her Johns. Hmm. A little different. Um, anyways, blah, blah, blah. we know from her case, if you've seen the movie Monster with Charlize Theron and, and um, Christina Ricci, you know the story. She was in love with Ty, Tyree. Um, and Tyree became her downfall. That's what brought her down in the end. So we know that she was a person who was ahead of her time. She had a same sex relationship. She was very open about her relationship and she knew that others weren't going to approve of it. But for Aileen, that possibly left her with the best way that she could connect to another person because even though her grandmother had been very violent both physically and emotionally abusive to her with the alcoholism and you know women had not attacked her they hadn't used her at the same capacity that men had which explains later why she's very vocal about men and, and her opinion of them. And, you know, she seems to think that they're all out to get women. So for her to develop a very loving relationship with a woman makes a lot of sense. Well, she's, you know, documented with this woman named Tony. They, she says that the relationship was passionate and it also came with some jealousy and some physical violence. The two decided that they were going to start a cleaning firm, even though their personal relationship was rocky on its best day. They still decided it was a great idea to enter this partnership, and they're going to start up this steam cleaning service. <laughs> well, eventually, Tony comes to her senses, just like the, you know, partners of Lee's past. And Lee was standing on a tightrope and it would take just one messed up for all hell to truly break through. And Tony saw that. She recognized it. So she decided, hmm, see you later. So several months into their little venture of starting the cleaning service, Tony takes off ending the relationship with Lee and taking away all of the cleaning equipment, which Lee will later state in life that 
The only things left behind were a fan and a phone bill for $485. And Lee is very adamant that the only reason they were able to even start this business, to open it, to run it, to have the, all of that, was because of her earnings from her forever side gig of being a sex worker. So there we are again. You know, I did this and she took it from me. She's the bad guy. For Lee, no matter what happens, she has to paint the other person as the bad guy. Once Tony was gone with the wind, Lee borrows a new alias, borrows a new alias, Lori Grody from Michigan. And she was cited by Florida State Troopers for driving with a suspended license. On January 4th of 1986, Lee is arrested yet again for resisting arrest, grand theft, and obstruction of justice. Inside of the car was a 30 caliber firearm. Lee bailed off and poof, she's gone again. On April 30th of 1986, Lee sentencing trial, which she had already pled guilty to these charges. She was set to be sentenced once again for her massively stupid crime. But did she show up? No, she didn't. Each bad decision that she made during this time was enough for me to ask what would have happened had she chose the other one? Because she always came to this fork in the road with a very glaringly bad path in a very bright, sunny, colorful path. And she seemed to go down that glaring one time and time again, even though it was the rockiest freaking travel for her. She still did it. Why? Well, come June 2nd, Lee is questioned after a male companion accuses her of him, of Aileen pulling a gun on him and demanding he gave her $200. Lee was found with a 22 pistol under the passenger seat of the vehicle she was occupying. She was arrested and charged with the grand theft and carrying a concealed firearm. She bailed out and poof, she was gone again. Yet another bench warrant was issued for Aileen Carol Warnos. A week following her arrest for the grand theft, Susan Blahovic was ticketed for speeding in Jefferson County. The citation included one telling observation on the citation. Quote, attitude poor, she thinks she is above the law, end quote. This is a very good key factor in telling us that Susan was not the person sitting in the driver's seat. Instead, it was this lady named Wee, which we know her as Aileen. Susan, just another name she randomly grabs. 1986 proved to be one for the record books because Lee was arrested in Dane County for grand larceny charges and resisting arrest. These charges, however, did eventually get dropped. Luck may be tipping towards Lee's side because inside of a Daytona gay bar, 30-year-old Aileen Warnos meets Tyree Ty Jolene Moore. Lee was lonely and angry and ready for something new. What she didn't know is this something new would lead Lee to doing the thing that would take Ty from her and guaranteeing her a seat inside of Florida's death row.
When looking at history like this, you can't help but say, no wonder. Or think that others have gone through worse and come out for the better. But when you have a combination of mental health issues from parents and probable undiagnosed mental health issues of your own, coupling with a physical and sexual abuse, it is all a recipe for destruction. Taking from someone the ability to love another leaves them with nothing inside. You take from them the ability to care about others, whether it's about their safety and well-being or how one's actions affect the way that the other one works. You take from them the very thing that makes a person a person, and that isn't something that anyone is entitled to. From the moment that Aileen was born, the world showed her how much no one wanted her. They didn't want the responsibility to care for her, to show her how to navigate the world. Instead, she learned how to fight everyone she crossed paths with. She learned to take from them what she needed and what she wanted, and she learned to survive by any means necessary, even if that meant someone else had to die. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight for the first installment of Aileen's case, Miss American Serial Killer. I'm using quite a few books with the research, so let me start off by recommending to you Dear Dawn, Aileen in Her Own Words, edited by Lisa Kester and Daphne Gottlieb, G-O-T-T-L-I-E-B. It's a book of letters that Aileen wrote her childhood best friend, Dawn. It offers you the raw side of Aileen and how she recalls the events that landed her on death row in the state of Florida. It's almost heartbreaking to see her struggle with trusting others because in her mind, it was forced to think about everyone being out to get you. Join me next week as we take a deeper look at the relationship with Tyree and how she spiraled out of control and began taking the lives of men who were simply looking to pick up a woman and pay for a sexual encounter. As always, I leave you with one last line. Every emotion in the human spectrum is actually a teacher that is here to show us the degree in which we are either resisting or flowing with life. Much love, the true crime librarian.